this and that. All right. So um, let me adjust my sound and brightness. All right. So next week, no class is the only scheduling note of great importance. Uh, here's the first visiting speaker coming on April 3rd, and there'll be several coming after that. Um, so, including the CCDC, Western Regional CCDC Black team should be coming to talk to us. We're working that out, but they volunteered, and I said that would be swell, and I'll try to put them on Saturday. So they'll be for Liz's 124 class, and uh, hope that should be good for us, because that's very important to us in many ways. Anyway, so um, uh, let me just take a look at the news. There's a lot of exciting news. Um, this one's actually very interesting. And uh, this one, pretty unbelievable. Yeah, there's several fun things coming out. Um, that one's all right. And... Anyway, here's a few fun things. So Putty, I'm um, used to fight a lot as a target. Of course, the famous SSH client. Uh, there's a, some in the exploit development class in the malware analysis class, we play with Putty at the binary level. And it turns out Putty has had some very interesting flaws. I didn't know it was this extreme, but they've got, um, and you can make a fake login page in Putty and steal patterns passwords with it. That sounds like good fun. You can do code execution by chum hijacking. Chum is the old, 16-bit Windows help files, and they use them in PuTTY, and you can make a malicious chum file, which will take over the machine when they connect to it. So that sounds, I got to try some of this stuff. It really sounds like good, clean fun. I already use PuTTY as a target in other classes, and there's buffer overflow in the tools, and there's uh, reusing cryptographic random numbers. Their random number generator has a overflow in the nonce, so it accidentally rolls out and repeats numbers sometimes. Sounds like it doesn't happen very often, but, but it's pretty interesting. There's an integer overflow in the key size of RSA keys. These are pretty interesting phones. It would be kind of good to get to the bottom of them and develop exploits based on them. Um, so this is a real U.S. government program. The British really made a government program called Skynet. And now we are making a program called Skyboard to make flying artificial intelligent drones to shoot people. And they're determined to have these things really running within two years. And so it is uh, kind of mind boggling that they use that name and have this plan. And especially, I think it's more and more obvious uh, what all the people in the field have told me is everyone getting worried about AI is out of their mind. AI is nowhere near ready to do any of this awesome stuff. It's like Siri. It's slightly useful occasionally, but it's not at all going to, I mean nobody has a job and it does all the work for you but a lot of people seem to believe that and here's an example so if you're really getting to the bottom of what happened to these boeings and it is pretty horrible they decided they didn't want them to stall so they have an automatic process that pushes the nose down to make you go faster and if you have a bad sensor which they did it keeps on pushing the nose down when you try to pull up and the pilots can't figure out how to turn it off and this, the amazing thing here is they, one of the passengers was a pilot and happened to come up and show them how to turn it off the day before it crashed. So that flight was okay. The next day, the same people drove the same plane without him there to turn it off and they crashed it. So this is sort of like the Teslas that will plow right into people standing in the road. And they say there's nothing wrong with them. And these guys say there's nothing wrong with the plane. It just points straight towards the ground and won't let you bring the nose up. But that's by design. It's okay. And I'm like, wow. These are the people telling me they're going to have AI in two years that we can trust. I really don't think so. Um, so James Diamond, a big financier, J.P. Morgan Chase, is talking about how he wants to be better, uh, take care of poor people better, which is not what you usually hear from rich people like that. And he says that this uh, thing about college degrees is pretty much all bogus and you can learn enough at a community college, which is also something you don't hear from these kind of people too often. Um, so... That's pretty interesting. We're moving college graduation retirements. 75% of the patients don't require a college degree. There should be more positions for community college graduates and ex-cons and stuff. I th he really seems to uh, have some very sensible attitudes about this. And I think I've been waiting for this because uh, this next article is more the same. The New York had a good article about the college scam. I mean, 
there's the thing about Ivy League colleges, even before the latest scandal of them just taking bribes to let people in, you pay so much money. You go a hundred grand in debt for this degree from the famous college, and it is what is it really worth it? And in many ways, it's really not worth it. In, in ways it is worth it, it's really just corruption. Now you're in a special little secret club, and people are oh, also in the club, so you do each other favors, but it's, it's not much different than Britain's hereditary nobility. You join a group that you're in that gets special power for no enormously good reason. Anyway, so a lot of people are just uh, getting very mad about colleges, and what I've been waiting for is for the market to notice if these college degrees aren't actually worth anything, people should stop paying high salaries for them. Because right now, more and more people are still competing to get in these colleges as the price keeps going up because you really get more money having a college degree. But Google knocked off requiring a PhD, and apparently J.P. Morgan Chase is going to knock off requiring a degree at all. If they will, because I believe in the free market, Adam Smith, if the college degree person is not actually more valuable, then sooner or later, someone will notice that. And they say, we could make more money by hiring non-college degree people who are just as good. We don't have to pay them as much, like Moneyball. That guy figured out, I can get the second-rate football players and have a winning team for a lot less money because they're still good enough, even though they're not right at the top, and they're a whole lot cheaper. So you actually get more value for your money by going for them. So presumably, the market forces will eventually lead to an accurate assessment of the value of college. And I think college is worth a lot less than it's being treated as if it was worth. Anyway, CS degrees don't teach you much besides theory. Absolutely. It's... it's the colleges, I think, are, are an imitation of the British system, where I mean, a gentleman is not an instrument. All the way back to Confucius, they had this, that the, the nobility would not get their hands dirty by working, so you won't teach them practical skills. They will teach art or, or dance the minuet or something, and the commoners will do all the work, and they should go to like a trade school. And America doesn't have the trade school, and that's essentially what they want the community college to be. But um, when I, I started in the Ivy League at those high fancy colleges, and then when I got into a two-year college to work, I thought I would find it uh, boring and simple, and I didn't at all. I got Microsoft certification classes, and I said, boy, this is going to be a joke, and it was not a joke at all. It was very difficult, very interesting, very complicated, very well taught. I looked at it and I said, I've been lied to. They told me these people are all stupid. They're not stupid at all. <laughs> this blue-collar training is far more interesting than I thought it would be. And there's no gigantic difference between it and those fancy college stuff. So anyway, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to uh, not be so strict about it. Anyway, everyone's mad at Elon Musk, of course. Um, this is pretty good. Even more came out of this. So Devin Nunes is some kind of, I think, Republican politician. And somebody been making fun of him on Twitter. They made an account pretending to be his mom and an account pretending to be his dog or his horse or something and mocked everything he said. And he sued for millions of dollars against these people, which is just shows that he can't take a joke and claimed that Twitter was allowing these people to impersonate his mom. And they make an account called Devin Nunes' mom saying, stop being a naughty boy and stuff. He can't realize that people know it's a joke. And so now the news from today is his horse now has more followers than him. But anyway, he, he, this is like the Streisand effect. He's made the parody accounts far more famous by actually taking them seriously. That makes, makes the joke funnier. I remember the Marx Brothers movies. These guys would do all this crazy stuff, and there was this one woman who always played an opera singer, and they said the thing about her, she always was getting mad at them. And he said the thing about her, she didn't think they were funny. She took them seriously. She was deeply offended by them being rude, and that made it funnier. You know, that's the foil. And you have the crazy people, and you have the people who are stiff and get mad about it, and that just makes the joke funnier. And Devin Nunes is apparently that guy that can't take a joke and thinks we should ban all jokes and punish everyone who dares to tell one. So Elon Musk just keeps on saying wild and crazy, stupid things about the stock price, and he won't shut up. It's sort of like Trump. Maybe he can run for president. He, 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 he will promise to shut up. He'll get a court order to shut up, and then he'll just get mad and go on Twitter and say all the stuff they just told you not to say. Now the judges are putting him in contempt and everything else. Say, dude, what do you do when you give a guy a court order? And he just ignores it. You can't be doing that. Well, if you're president, you can do that. Maybe he's close enough to president to get away with it. I guess we're going to see. Um, anyway, uh, we have a lot of these characters around. The kings of the earth think they can do anything they want. Um, all right. Well, I'm just going to go ahead with this uh, class stuff here because I had a very good time at the latest chapter. There's a lot of information in here to make new projects. We have three new projects now, which I thought were very good. 
And but the first thing I'm going to do is the cahoots. There were no cahoots last week, so I put them up this week. So I got cahoots from last week. Let's see if you remember anything from last week. Yeah, I know. We'll see. But what the cahoots are the one part of the class that's graded on a curve. All you have to do is remember more about last week than the other students in order to win the cahoots. So if they only remember 2%, you only have to remember 3%. So, all right, uh, CNET 128. Um, that's right. That's right. And uh, you guys are doing pretty well by just showing up, right? The people who don't watch it live don't get a chance to compete. So, all right. So, anyway. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. The cahoots are pretty popular in all my classes. I think they help wake people up. Anyway, they certainly give me some clue whether any of this is getting through in a simple level. Anyway, so um, I should have the joy of cahoots here and uh, cahoots. And I think I need it to be like this. Okay, and so here's A day. And what's my sound doing? There should be some sound. All right. Yeah, there's some sound. Okay, good. Are you going to make it to the thing on Thursday at the Chinatown campus? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, just it'd be good to have you. You have a photo op with the Board of Trustees, and it may save our jobs. So. Yeah, I'm going to try to make it. Yeah, well, so I don't know. Sounds like maybe six is when it's going to really happen. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. Well, I don't think we really have to all be there, but some of us have to be there, so they have a presence. Anyway, it's politics. It matters politics. Anyway. Well, let's see if we got any more uh, victims. There's 10 people online, but they appear to be Kahoot abstainers. Perhaps they're all asleep. They wandered away from keyboard. I'll give it another five seconds. Aha. Yes, these are the ones I did not do last week. So the competition will be less because everyone's forgotten everything. So, aha, looks like he's logging in on the phone. We may get another competitor here. That's good. Well, if there's only three people doing it, then it begins to lose meaning. So this is this is enough. Oh, there we are. The magic. This is now getting up to getting up to a reasonable race. It's Kahoot.it. And there's the number. Good. Yes, one five five one six five. That's you. Okay. Then we're gonna go. We got everyone that matters. So, all right. All right. So, for a custom update function in your app, what permission does your app have to have? It must have install packages, so it can install a new version of itself, and that makes it much more dangerous. Then if someone compromises that app, they have install packages permission, which makes it a lot easier to take over the phone. So what's the Java class that lets an app load new code at runtime? It's Dex class loader that adds new code at runtime. This is like Microsoft's famous DIL files. And in both cases, adding other code at runtime is extremely dangerous and leads to a ton of exploits. That's, that's obviously a risky thing to do. But it's obviously a very convenient thing to do to get features, so everybody does it anyway, and you have risks. Anyway, so uh, what's the intent filter if you want to have a custom URL, like Pwn, to lead to your app? Okay, that's browsable. That's what it means. That means something you can get to your app with a URL. All right. And if you want to let a web page execute Java code, 
first, how would you do it? And then why would you do it? But anyway, it's, this is really dangerous. Okay, it's in the web views, and there's a feature to let you add, run Java in the operating system from the web. This has happened over again. Microsoft put it in IE and called it um, ActiveX. Google put it in Chrome and called it native code. It turns out to be another one of those things that although it's completely insane, it is so convenient that people do it anyway. Anyway, so. Does IE still have ActiveX on Microsoft finally abandoned ActiveX. And they abandoned the Java plugin and the Silverlight plugin and the Flash plugin, all of which did more or less the same thing and switched to HTML5, which is apparently safer. So uh, that particular level of this madness seems to have abated a bit. But this is essentially the Android version of the same thing. And as we're going to see today, Android is even worse than I thought it was. I'm really loving this book. This guy goes deeper into Android, and the deeper you go, the rotten air gets. Anyway, um, so uh, Forrest, Maribel, and Albert. Those look like real names. Neat. That makes it more convenient. There's still a few people who never got their points because their name is something like Hubcap, and we can't figure it out. But anyway, um, so all right, so. Yeah. Yeah, if you want the points, it's best to have something vaguely resembling the name. Anyway, um, so here we are with Chapter 8B, yet more madness about Android. So um, and I'm just going to start a few virtual machines because I'm definitely going to have to demonstrate this stuff. So there is a Kali machine, and here's Knox. Knox is the one I'm going to use for most of what we're doing today. Um, Knox is Android 5 which is actually very nice because you had a bunch of horrible things in Android 5 that are actually better by Android 9. You can put Android 5 in Jenny motion, but I did use the latest version. Anyway, it turns out that Android 5 is the cat's meow for the stuff we're going to be doing today. So um, at least some of it. Anyway, so um, we've been through this stuff. Now we're in this part, which is the middle of it, um, up to page 402. There's more coming after this next time. and. Um, so here we're going to talk about physical attacks. If you have stolen someone's phone, what can you do? And this, another case, which is very important, the one where I all started was computer forensics. If you have taken a phone from a crime scene and you are the cops, how do you get the data off that phone? This is a huge issue and people pay a lot of money for forensic kits. Everyone needs to do it all the time and it is not terribly easy. As a matter of fact, for iPhones, the standard was to jailbreak the phone get root on it, then you copy all the data, but that has not been practical for a long time. There has not been a public jailbreak that works for normal phones, and it's been getting harder and harder to get the data. So now I think in practice, they pretty much forget it and go to iCloud, where it's, you can just get it with a court order. And the FBI is still very, very sore that Apple knocked it off because until five years ago, all you had to do is write a check for $300, attach a court order, and mail the phone to Apple, and they would mail you all the data because they had a back door onto the phone and they would just open it up and copy all the data onto something and give it to you and the cops are used to that. If we need the data, we can get the data. And when Apple started saying no, they felt very upset. What's going on here? What do you mean you can't get it your own device? What are you, nuts? And they still are yelling, this is crazy, but that's where we are. Just a quick question, is there yeah. still good phones still being made? Is there, is there a way to get data off both groups? Yes, uh, you know, feature phones, they call them. The things that are not smartphones. Yes, you can get data off them, and that's usually pretty easy to get data off them. Um, there are, if you buy a French kit for like 10,000 bucks, you'll get like 100 adapters, and you can plug in and suck the data off those things. Now, there are expensive devices that will really suck all the data off. You can also get it other ways, and this is something to know from computer friendships. If you go to court and you say, I found this evidence on the phone, the evidence is not what you found on the phone. The evidence is the human talking. That is the evidence. The highest standard of evidence in American court is a human testifying. And the idea is that the jury can judge whether you are credible. They can tell if you're lying and they can tell if you're incompetent. So the expert and the expert witness is a special category of human that can transmute hearsay into facts. They're the only person that can do this. So an expert can take indirect evidence, like I looked at the logs and the inspected this device, and then they can render an expert opinion, which is that proves this. Everybody else is not allowed to speculate. They say, you only say, I saw this happen. They say, well, I have some other evidence that makes me think it happened. You can't talk about that. You have to have really seen it or it's not important, except for the expert witness, who is the magic person with the golden touch that can change uh, letting the gold. They can change something that is hearsay into real evidence based on their credibility. And so you can take 
data off to sell a feature phone, and people do, by just paging through the messages and taking photographs. And you take the photographs to court because the real evidence is you saying, I looked at the phone, that evidence was on there. That's what real evidence is. All the rest of it is just something to argue out with the other expert. But I mean, even if you just looked at it and didn't write it down, it would still be evidence to say, I saw it. But still, the, the writing it down makes it more clear. And so you do not have to have a perfect process to extract the data from the phone for it to be valuable. But of course, the most professional, best thing to do is to totally suck all the data off the phone in some clear way to know you've got it all. And um, that's what you used to be able to do. And that's the case here. So I steal a phone, what can I get off the phone? Now, the first thing is, um, if they didn't even lock their phone, then of course they're wide open. I can just go start it, I will be them. I can go in their social media account and their phone call log and everything and find out everything they've been doing. So that's easy. But most people, this is their defense. They have a PIN code. Now, um, a few years back, there were these devices that would just try every possible PIN. There were even like some old robot arms that would like poke everything. And so they, most of these will now only let you try five or 10 times before they lock you out or wipe the device or something. So that's not gonna work. So this is your main line of defense. And most people feel safe by this, but it turns out in Android, it is very easy to bypass this code and get right to the phone as if you had logged in, which is just what this is supposed to prevent. And of course, as you know, the same thing is true of Windows machines and Apple machines and everything. The, the password you use to log in does not really protect your privacy at all. There are tons of ways to get right past it. And this is probably like the number one or number two most common tech support problem. I forgot my password. Every tech support person knows a hundred ways to get past your password. Therefore, that password is not really stopping very many bad guys. It's like a TSA lock. Unless you really have full disk encryption, then that password begins to have some strength. Anyway, so to get past this thing, there's two general techniques. You do it with USB debugging or you change the bootloader. Um, so USB debugging is what we've been using in almost everything in this class. You connect with USB cable or you simulate that with the TCP version. And then you have ADB shell to get in there. Now the problem is USB debugging is turned off on real phones by default before they sell them. Unless you have a, a ridiculous security violation, it is considered outrageously insecure to sell people a phone USB debugging turned on. So typically it is turned off. And that means um, you can't do much. And by modern phones, uh, all modern versions of Android will even pop up a box asking the user for permission to turn on USB debugging, even if you try to turn it on through a cable. And this box cannot appear if it's locked. So you can't get USB debugging turned on until you pass the bootloader or so it would appear. But that turns out not to be so true. And we've heard a bunch of these exploits. They're very simple. The, the, the fundamental problem here is you have created a complicated situation. We're talking about this in the cryptography class with authenticated encryption with associated data. Even a very simple technical problem, like I want to encrypt data, turns out to be very complicated and there are mistakes made. But if you make it more complicated by trying to do three or four different things all at once, it's very likely that there will be a hole or a bug. And that's what's happening here. Think about your lock screen. You want to lock it so nobody can use the phone, except if you get a call, then it'll bypass the lock screen. Except if you have to make an emergency call, it'll bypass the lock screen. Except if you get an SMS, that app is allowed to pop things on front of the lock screen. Other apps are allowed to unlock the phone. Now suddenly, it's very far from being, nobody can get past this lock screen. It's like there's 10 authorized ways to get past the lock screen. And if any one of them makes a mistake, you can get in. And that's what happens. So all these, um, so this one here, all you had to do was go to the emergency dialer and then, um, or the camera and then go back and you'd be in, you will turn it on. This, we've got to see the USB authorization with the screen locked. And then there's privilege levels. Now, in early versions of Android, you went to this file called catdefault.prop and you found this parameter in there. There's just a few text files to control the state of your Android phone, just like uh, Apache and other Linux programs. And so this thing called RO secure determines whether you ADB can run as root. And if this is one, ADB cannot run as root. But if it's zero, ADB runs as root. So this is part of rooting a phone. Normally ADB does not have root permissions, it has less permissions, you can't do so much. Uh, for Android 4.3 onward, even if you turn that number to zero, you still can't run ADB as root. They decided it was too dangerous. So you have to recompile it with this special flag in compile time to allow this. This is the same thing happened with say Netcat. If you try to take over machines in Windows or Linux environment, one thing people like to do is NCAT minus L minus X, uh, I spin slash bash, so it'll listen to a connection, and when a connection comes in, it'll launch bash. That's the old-fashioned way to make a shell. So they considered that version of Netcat too dangerous to use, and modern versions of Netpack have been compiled with a similar flag, so they will not execute code on a connection.
and that you can have to understand, you, otherwise you have to install legacy netcat or something if you want these dangerous features. Anyway, that's the game. So you have to modify your phone by putting on custom binaries if you want to allow that feature. But there's these bootloaders. Now, I don't have projects about them. We talked about this. As far as I can tell, these things have kind of fallen into disfavor. But maybe five years ago, these things were all the rage. Everybody was hacking their phone, putting custom ROMs on it. And you were like, not cool if you didn't do that. And um, so what you do is you boot, the phone, you boot the phone into fast boot mode. Now, this is like the recovery mode. Every operating system, Windows and, and Mac and everything has a recovery mode. Cisco routers do. If it can't boot, there's some kind of recovery mode, which you're intended to use to like reinstall the operating system or fix a driver or something like that. And Android phones have it too. They have a recovery mode. And you can put custom recovery ROM in there so it will have unexpected function. And of course, if you could boot to recovery mode, then you could just copy all the data off the phone. That's the idea. Uh, uh, Macs have a thing called target disk mode where you use your Mac as like a USB disk. And these are there so you can do a ghost image and put an operating system on it or repair a broken one or something. They're, um, they're available. So you can do it with ADB, ADB reboot bootloader. The problem is none of these emulators support that. The emulators are virtual machines and they have, do not support, do not have a second disk partition to be the recovery image, although real phones do. And this, like I've been saying, I really need to buy a few real phones and start doing it there. You can only go so far with these emulators. If you really want to get into Android, you have to work with real devices. And this is one of the areas where a real device is a must. And I have a few. I just haven't gotten up to interested in it yet, but it's coming. So we do not have projects with these bootloaders, but it is an option. Um, however, the thing I noticed is the popular bootloaders are extremely old, like based on Android 2. And so my feeling is very much that this is an old trick that is not that relevant anymore. And I think the reason is, I saw an article with like the 10 reasons why you need to put on a bootloader, and they're all features that are already in Android. So I think that's the point. Uh, the only reason people did this is there was a time when Android was way behind in the features, and Android caught up, and now there's really nothing you can put on with these bootloaders that's really worth the bother for most people. But here's how it looks. You can do fast boot OEM unlock. Then you've unlocked the bootloader, and now you can boot it from another system. And this is like on these PCs, you lock the BIOS, so you can't boot from CD. And of course, if you could boot from a CD, you could totally steal all the data off of things. You boot from CD and copy from the hard drive, unless it's encrypted. And the same thing's true of your Android phone. If you can boot a custom ROM, then obviously the pin code and the password and everything don't matter. I can just copy all the data right off there. So um, if you decide to unlock the bootloader, when you unlock the bootloader, it will wipe all the user data. This is a security feature. So the idea is you can take a phone, you can unlock it and boot it to repair it, but you'll lose all the data because you might be a thief that stole the phone and they don't want you to steal the data. So this is like a destructive reset. Uh, many laptops have this option. Return to factory defaults, put on the original operating system, lose all the data. That's what you get this way. That sounds pretty good. So the only people that are vulnerable are people who actually broke, turned off the bootloader, unlocked it, and then left it unlocked and kept using their phone that way, which will be the sort of sloppy people. And remember, the same thing used to happen back when everybody was jailbreaking their iPhones. If you just jailbreak your iPhone, you would put on SSH, and SSH would be listening with the default root password of Alpine. And a lot of people did not understand that. So the jailbroken phones were very, very vulnerable. And if you do jailbreak your device and put on a custom operating system, now security is your responsibility. And if you don't know what you're doing, you will probably make yourself much more vulnerable. The experts always say you should do it because if you know what you're doing, you can put on better security patches and be less vulnerable. And of course, both of those things are true. If you're an expert, it could be better. If you're not an expert, you could be making your device worse in every way. But um, anyway, that's the game. It's a clockwork mod recovery ROM is one of the big famous ones, but it hasn't been updated in a long time. It was the standard uh, custom operating system put on there. So that's one thing you could in principle do with a real device, but now another thing you can do is you can use the disable key guard permission. You, I mentioned your SMS app has the ability to pop something up on the screen even when the phone is locked. Other apps have the ability to turn off the lock screen. So if you had an app under your control that could turn off the lock screen, you could totally get past the lock screen. So that's totally available to us. So you can have it right here. You turn on key guard manager, and there are Java commands that will open, turn off the key guard, which is the lock screen. So you can make that Drozer agent. You, this is the, Drozer is awesome for this. You can build any kind of malware. You can have any permission you want. So you can build the Drozer agent with that, and then you can unlock your phone. And this is in the homework, and I think I'm set to do it here. So let's take a look. So here's my phone. 
and it's locked. It needs a pin code, but I can totally unlock it without knowing the pin code. Because this is Android 5, it doesn't work so well in Android 9. But if I do here, I go to, um, all right, I'm going to um, make a directory, I guess. Uh, let's call it Drozer. I guess that'll do. All right. So I wrote the project. I made these extra credit. Oh, yes. And this reminds me, there's a project that was causing even more suffering than usual. Um, the Home Depot project. I finally decided I'm just going to call it extra credit because um, students were having trouble. Then I tried to write the revised version, and then it changed again. This is insane. When you download this app, you don't always get the same thing at all. You sometimes get an app that comes in four files. You sometimes get an app that comes in one file. Sometimes the four files have names with one X or two X or three X's in them. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how you could do this if you tried. But I, it's very random. It'll drive you nuts. So I made it extra credit. It's far more suffering than it should be. Um, I, it might be interesting to get to the bottom of what in the world have they done here. How can you have multiple different apps coming from the same store on apparently the same device? But anyway, it does. So that, that one, don't worry about it unless you want to suffer. Um, but the new other new ones I put in are this one here, Trojany and App of Metasploit, which is very nice. I'll probably do that at the end because these are the ones that are directly relevant to today's lecture. And in particular, 13X is the one I want to talk about now. Pretty much everything's going to be extra credit. I think I only have room for like one more normal project, which is what usually happens about halfway through when I have a good textbook. There's so much to do that, that I can't make it all fit in. So there'll be lots of extra credit. So you should all get an A if you do some of these things, which is fine because you're doing something. So to bypass a screen lock, you put a screen lock on your phone, and then um, you have to downgrade your Java to an older version of Java because Drozer can't use the latest version of Java, which is in fact a very common problem. And one of the many reasons why Java is very productive of suffering. But anyway, it turns out to be pretty easy. After a lot of searching, I found an easy way to downgrade Java to an older version, and then Drozer will work correctly. So this is the Drozer command that builds an app with the disabled key guard permission. So, I will make that. Let me make this go to a place where I can see if my mouse will only get hold of something. All right. So that builds an agent with AP with Drozer, uh, which has that permission, disable key guard. So off it goes. All right. Now I need to put that agent on the phone. So first I need to connect to my phone and something I put in some of the projects, but I didn't know this at the start of the semester, it's not in all of them, is NetDiscover. So this is I, the cool way. I used to go into the phone and try to find the IP address. Now I wised up. This is how hackers do it. You scan the network to see what's on the network. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely easy to find your phone because everything is VMware and one of them is not. That's the phone. Uh, this is so much more fun than hunting through settings Wi-Fi to try to figure out what your IP address is. So there's my IP address. I do ADB connect to that IP address. Now I'm connected. Life is good. I'm on the phone. Now if I want to see which phone I've got, I can do ADB devices minus L. And um, this is Shamu. Shamu is Knox. They named it after a whale, I guess. But anyway, um, you get used to these silly names. Everything open source always has to have silly names. Um, yeah. Wondering about the port number. Oh, oh, the port number by default is I think 5555. And you don't have to specify it if it's the default. A few of them you move to another port. I think um, blue stacks, you have to move to another port and then you have to specify. Good. Anyway, so um, now I've got my malware. I've got my app. I want to put it on the phone so I can do ADB install. And I've just made this thing called, um, come on, it's not scrolling back for some reason. Um, scroll back, I say. Hmm. Well, all right. LS. Well, all right. What is going on here? Currently scanning oh, fish. Hmm, that's strange. I can't scroll. And, uh, and I wanted to see what happened when I did that previous command because I thought it was going to create some stuff. Oh, wait, I think I put it in a temp folder. That's right. And so I really need to scroll back. And what's going on here? I totally will not scroll back. Ah, finally, but only that far. Oh, because this killed the history or something. All right. Well, that's a drag. All right. So, uh, I think a proper dump using Celebrite would give decent evidence. Well, Celebrite is the company that sells you things, and I think that is the whole point. It can't, doesn't work on modern iPhones. That's what the IBM, that the FBI found out four years ago. 
Uh, even Shellebright cannot get the data off a modern iPhone. That's why the FBI is very angry and they say iPhone is a phone special to especially for terrorists and everything else. They're very, very annoyed. Even your expensive commercial stuff cannot get it off an iPhone anymore. And that is new. Five years ago, what you're saying is absolutely true. If you paid $10,000 for Celebrite, you could just totally suck the data off every phone. And that's what the cops felt like they should be allowed to do. And they're not very pleased that it's not true anymore. Anyway, um, however, you can get evidence in practice out of iCloud. Anyway, I guess I have to make the Drozer thing again because I cannot see, I can't scroll back, which is rude, but such is life. So I'll make another one. Because uh, when it compiles, it puts it in a randomly generated temp folder. And I forgot to copy the name. This is the name of the where it put it. So, uh, and for some reason, I guess NetDiscover breaks your history or something. Anyway, so now I've tried to install it with ADB install, that thing. And I will get install failed, which is something you should be getting used to by now. There's already a Drozer agent on the phone. And I can't have another one because when it made this, it re-signed it. It created a new sig it automatically created a signature and signed it with a different signature. So it's not recognized as an authorized update. However, I can just uninstall the old one. So uninstall the old one. And I think I might have to refer to it by the correct package name. So let me go here. Yep, mine is com.mwr.gz. That's the actual official package name of the Drozer agent the name of the company and so i can uninstall it and that is success just not showing on my screen and now i should be able to install the new one and there it goes success so now i put the poison app on the phone now i can start the app to start the app i send it a broadcast message saying start embedded because i can't click on it because i'm locked out of the phone so I start embedded and I forward the TCP ports because I'm going to run a Drozer agent and we've done this before. Drozer sends commands to the phone over port 31415. So the Drozer agent is listening and I have to forward that port to my local system. And now I have the ability to send data over the network in there, which will execute on the phone in the context of the Drozer agent. Now Drozer can connect. Now that I've done that, I can do Drozer console connect and I should get the, uh, hmm, that's rude. Let's see if I have ADB shell. I do, okay, it's not ADB. Uh, it appears to be some problem with my Drozer app running. Let's see, oh, maybe I forgot to start it again. I think I put it on, I forgot to start it again. Well, let's see, let's see if it works now. Drozer console connect, nope, connection refused. Well, that's annoying. Let's try to port forward again. Uh, I don't see the, oh, there, I don't see the port forward. I think so, I somehow forgot to do the port forward. Let me try that. Get rid of this. There's the forward. All right, let's see if I can do this now. Oh, good. Life is good. Now I get the happy evil Android. So now I have Drozer. Now I would like to do a post exploitation module, and it turns out you cannot use them until you install them. Their optional feature of Drozer, you have to install them with module install post. And when you do, it will ask you where to put them. So you could put them anywhere. I just recommend use your local Drozer just as somewhere to put them. Um, mine's just going to tell me you already have them. But the first time, you have to pick a directory and we'll put them in there. Uh, Metasploit has a similar uh, process that is, in fact, actually much harder and more confusing. This one asks you where it goes. Metasploit automatically puts it somewhere where they're hard to find. Anyway, so now I have the post exploitation modules. And since I have them, I can run a post exploitation module called perform disable lock screen, which is pretty obvious what it is. And so here's my Knox. And when I run this, yeah, I'm in the phone and I don't have the pin. So that pin didn't stop me at all. Of course, I had ADB USB debugging as root. So in a way, you'd say, why do you even care? Because you can get all the data off the phone. But the fact is, even if I can get the data off the phone, I can't go into these apps and impersonate this person and send emails from their email account and stuff. And now I can. So there are certain things I can do now that I couldn't do before, although I could do quite a lot. But anyway, that's pretty good. So attempting to disable key guard and it works. This does not work on Android 9, but it totally works on Android 5. All right, so uh, that's the game here. Now here's another fun thing, which I was pretty amazed about. I heard about this and I finally got a chance to do it. Uh, there's a typo in this, not that it matters much, unless people are really using gestures. But that's just a T, of course, for gesture. Anyway, so the um, if you have a login, 
pin or gesture, it has to store that on the phone somewhere, and here's where it stores it. Data system, password.key, and gesture.key. This, again, seems only to be true of older versions of Android. Android 9, I did not find it here, and I hope it's doing something better, because this is horrible, as we're going to see. So here's a simple attack. Just delete that file. Then there's no longer a pin. You can totally get in. That's rude. Um, that's a very simple, we could have done that. That's a, even simpler than what we just did. Just delete the, the password.key file, and there will no longer be a pin. Restart the phone, there will no longer be a pin on it. I didn't make a project out of that. That would be too easy, but it'd probably be worth trying. Anyway, um, however, we're going to do something that's a little more fun than that. See if I can get this thing to blow up. There we are. All right. So if you want to remove those files, by the way, you have to be system or root. They are owned by system, and they're read-write by owner and not by anybody else. They have made some attempt to prevent everyone from just casually deleting these files. But um, as you know, it's fairly easy to escalate to root. So anyway, here there is also other things. There's an intent. They didn't explain exactly how it works in the book. Apparently, it's complicated. But they found on Android 4.3 and earlier, you can send this special intent, and it will unlock the phone. So uh, that's a fun thing to know. And then you can look, of course, for logic flaws. Like we talked about, there's some combination of getting a phone call, getting a text message, hitting the back button, hitting the home button, where you get access to the phone without passing through the pin. This happens to iPhones, too. There are often little things you can do. Basically, often teenagers and kids find this. They're just poking around on their phone, and they find that there's some combination of pokes that does. This one, make emergency phone calls, answer the phone, and then uh, go back so Motorola Droid had this vulnerability. If you just answer a call and press back, you end up on the desktop without passing through the pin. Uh, Viber was an app that would do the same thing. You'd get a Viber call, and now if you press the back button a bunch of times, it sends you back to the phone. Because the way it lets you enter a call without unlocking the phone is it moves the lock screen for a while. This is how most privilege escalation works. You have a process like a password changing function that escalates to root and does something dangerous and then comes down. And you just have to make it crash while it's up there. And then you're root. And that's essentially what you do here. It has to take away the lock screen to let you talk. So you just have to somehow break out of it while it's in that condition. Uh, this is also, by the way, true of kiosks. If you go to the store, like the supermarket, and, and uh, the uh, store that sells couches and stuff, they often have a kiosk where you can use their catalog, and that thing is running Windows machine, and it's running a maximized Internet Explorer browser, and Microsoft has a special thing called kiosk mode, and it is hilariously fragile. The same thing is true of those big panels, advertising things you see in hotels. Those things are desktops of Windows machines, and all you have to do is poke in the corner and mess around, and you can get a back to the command prompt and install games and change the picture and stuff. Anyway, so... Um, then, of course, there's other there's screen reset functionality. If you enter your PIN five times incorrectly, you're locked out of your phone. Just like most passwords, this is a tech support problem for Google. They don't want the millions of people constantly calling them to get locked out, so there's an easy way to get back in, of course. All you have to do is go online and sign in with your Google account, and you can unlock your phone from the web. So this means I can break into your phone by just breaking into your Google account which might be easier because I can just fish that or maybe find that password somewhere. But there's a thing called Android Device Manager, which is like Apple's Find My iPhone, where you can just bypass it from your Google account here. You can turn this on. There are various recovery means for when you lose your PIN. And of course, those are backdoors. Um, all right, and then there are remote attacks. Um, but if, before I do this, let me go to the other project, which is like mind-boggling. So I looked at the password storage, and I said, I wonder how that password is stored. And I looked it up, and it is even worse than I thought it was. Uh, I vaguely remembered the password is stored horribly, but it's much worse. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it stores the password on the phone. Well, I went and looked up how do you get the password off the phone, and as usual, there's like five or ten blogs that give you half of it. When you put them together, you can do it. So here's how you get the password off the phone. Um, the first part is pretty easy. If I exit from Drozer and then do ADB shell, shall I say, all I got to do is the data system. So CD to, oops, CD to data system. Um, all right, now LS. In fact, I can do LS minus L would be more fun. And here it is, password.key, 72 bytes. That is the encoded password on the phone. So I can just look at what's in there. Okay, and it's a hash function, this long pile of junk. Now, the first thing you might notice is this is a funny link. It's 72 characters. Now, that is kind of screwy. An MD5 
is 128 bits. You divide by four, it's 32 hex characters. A SHA-1 is 160. SHA-256, 256. This is not any of those. What this is, is so stupid as to defy belief. What this is, is the SHA-1 hash followed by the MD5 hash. So you have two chances to crack it. And it is that way so it could run on incredibly old, weak devices that could only run MD5, which I don't think have actually existed since the 80s. But anyway, that is just appalling. Uh, by the way, your, your Mac and Linux machines now have 5,000 rounds of SHA-512 plus assault. That is what's considered reasonably secure. One round of SHA-1 or MD5 is considered effectively plain text. And as you will see, that's what it is. However, it has assault. So you add something to the pin before you hash it. <coughs> but what you do is you store that in a SQLite database, and you can totally dump data out of a SQLite database with just SQLite 3 right on the Android phone. So I had to research a little bit of SQLite commands, but it's actually incredibly simple. You just do SQLite 3 and then a name of a database, and it lets you in <coughs> and shows you what's in the database. So if you do that, it opens the database, which is called locksettings.db. Now I'm in, and you can do dot tables to see what tables exist. And there's a table called lock settings, and you can just do select, just through what we do in all the hacking classes we talk about in uh, SQL injection, it is this simple. Select star from lock settings. Just tell me everything in that table, and I gotta put a semicolon to terminate it. And there it is, all the data, and there is the salt. Minus 101, 242, that long integer number is the salt. And that's it. It is, so I'll copy that number, but if you know that number and you know this number, you can deduce the pin. So uh, let me get out of here. It's um, dot quit to get out of here and exit to get out of there. And so here, now you can just calculate it with Python. So let me do these. If you open a Python shell anywhere like Android or the Mac, I guess I'll do it on a Kali. Um, probably not Android, but Kali will do it. Now I import a few libraries. All right. So here's the pin and there's the salt. My pin is in fact one, two, three, four. I know it. So the part of the project where I give you complete instructions, I just have you calculate the hash for the pin that you know and see how simple it is to calculate. So my pin is one, two, three, four, and the salt is that large integer that I got from a SQLite database. So I put them in, and here's how you do it. Just two commands. And all this does is it takes the salt and turns it into hex, and then pads it to be the right length. That's what this nonsense with hexify and bin ASCII does. <coughs> then it just takes the pin plus the salt and one's run round of SHA-1. That's it. That's all it does. So let me do this. And then for clarity, let me just show you what S is. There. This is what S is. This is just the hexadecimal version of that large negative number. As you probably know in hex, positive numbers are from zero through seven. Numbers from eight through F are negative numbers. So this is a large negative number. Anyway, um, you take that, you add it to the pin of one, two, three, four. You want one round of SHA-1 and you get seven FOF. And if you go back to what I got originally from the phone right here, it was seven FOF. The first two thirds of this are the SHA-1 hash, the rest of it is the MD5 hash, which would be even easier to crack, but SHA-1 is so fast you can just crack that. So I've reproduced the hash. That is Android's hashing algorithm, which is appalling. This is even worse than uh, Microsoft used in the days of MS-DOS LM hashes, which were so bad that in the 90s, the uh, dead cow, cult of the dead cow made a hacking tool that would just steal them right off the wire. That was one of the first exploits. You can go right into Windows systems back in the days of Windows 95 and Windows 98. And Microsoft was greatly humiliated. And uh, this, that system was like this. It's just amazing that they're actually using this. It, it, this is why you really have to do security audits of devices. If you haven't looked at it, it is far worse than you would ever believe. It's, uh, it's just amazing that they sell devices like this. They're just using security practices that we've known are complete garbage for 25 years. Obviously, nobody's looking. Anyway, um, so that's good, clean fun. And so for challenges, I gave you, I have a four-digit pin and you have to find it. and gave you an eight-digit pin and you have to find it because of the hash function like this. Trying 100 million choices is just a matter of 30 seconds of calculation in Python. That's the problem. I do this in my uh, 
ethical hacking class. Students try to find my Windows password with Microsoft's modern Windows storage routine, and they have to find my password in a list of 100 million also, because trying 100 million Windows passwords doesn't take very long. You can do more than a million per second, because the hashing algorithm is so terrible. If you had, like Linux, 5,000 rounds of SHA-512, you could only do like 10 or 20 of them per second. So searching a list of even 1,000 passwords is about all you can do. And therefore, just the name of your dog plus your birthday is good enough. But if you're going to have this kind of terrible hashing, then the only thing that wouldn't be easily cracked would have to be like 10 or 15 really random characters or something. Anyway, so that's the joy of Android password hashes. And uh, all right, so let me talk about remote exploits. Remote exploits are the classic thing everybody wants. You want to somehow take over a machine over the internet without even getting there. This is, you put up like a malicious web page and everyone that visits the web page gets infected. These are the people that really take over millions of devices. And there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, they're going to talk about some techniques here. I think it will come next semester talking about different kinds of Drozer agents. But um, here's the old fashioned way it's always been done over and over. This is the classic way we're going to do it next semester in 127, uh, exploit development. This is where you take over things like buffer overflows and format strings where you corrupt the memory in the browser. That is where you just have a page which is loaded in the browser and the browser handles it incorrectly and you take over the box. These things are awesome. This is like Eternal Blue, Eternal Romance, um, MS0867. These are the really exciting phones that just let you take over all the boxes using the native software. And of course, the people that make operating systems really try hard to fix these. These are the ones that really make scandals like all the famous iPhone jailbreaks are in this category. You could just go to a page and take over the phone. And Apple patched them in a hurry every time they found them. The, they, they really, this they have to fix. And these are hard to find for that reason. These are the ones people actually seriously patch. Um, what people don't get to, of course, are the kind of thing I find all the time, where you're doing some third-party app written by some company like Home Depot that just doesn't care. And their customers are pretty non-technical and don't care. And so they can just leave their app broken for years and nobody cares because all you can do is take over that one app and steal its data. So the uh, Polaris viewer was installed by default. This is something in retrospect that should have been obvious. It's always the PDF viewer. How many attacks went through Adobe PDF? Thousands of them. That's how the Mac, Mac used to have five reasons to buy a Mac. And number one used to be no malware until they put an Adobe PDF reader on it. That was the first virus that went through the Mac. And Apple tried to lie about it and told their tech support people to just hang up on anyone who said they've got infected. And that only lasted for like a month before it leaked out. And then they had to admit, yeah, there's a Mac virus. And we're pushing out a Mac antivirus tool. And now there's only four reasons to buy a Mac. And I really wish we'd never put that stupid PDF reader on the Mac. <laughs> but they did. And uh, so they put a PDF reader on the Samsung phones. And just like all the rest of them, P PDF, like I was saying about the uh, ex attack surface, if you make the situation complicated, like the lock screen, then there's going to be holes in it. And the problem is PDF files are really complicated. If they were just text files, you could just read them. But PDFs have images, they have code, they have sections, they have optional features, until so nobody can really keep it all straight, and there turn out to be a million ways to abuse it. If you, you have to have a simple job if you want to have it be secure. Anyway, so they got in here. This was a PDF viewer and a doc viewer built into the phones, and they made a crafted docx file that would just take over the machine. Yeah. Is that still installed on modern Macs? Uh, it is, but it's been patched. So the Macs have a vigorous program of updates, and they no longer claim to be virus free. And there are hundreds uh -huh. of Mac viruses. And now they have a, even have a periodic update from Apple to remove the known malware, which is like Microsoft's malicious software removal tool. In front of your Apple update, there will be the Apple virus removal, and it will report to Apple how many viruses it found. So they're not qualitatively different than anything else. And they used to feel like they were. So there's still a lot less malware on the Mac, but it's not like night and day like it used to be. So here's a Samsung Galaxy. You just have to visit the exploit page, and then you get taken over. Um, so it, if you go to this page, it downloads a file called download.docx, and when you launch that, you're owned. This is just like all the malware that we make and send people, and I'll show you one here, which I thought was good, clean fun. Um, that's the last new project I want to show you. Um, 
All right, anyway, so then there's the JavaScript interface. This lets you, your web views, execute Java code through JavaScript from a web page, which is just asking to be owned. So again, it only works if you're targeting older versions of Android, but that lets you take over the browser completely when people just view a web page, which is pretty awesome. And then if, and in the book, they have a long discussion of how to do it with Drozer, but I would just use Metasploit. Metasploit totally has Android modules, and this is one of the famous Android attacks. You can totally use Metasploit to make your malware and adjust it just like you're used to. And that gets me to the latest project. I'll uh, finish this first and then I'll show you that because I got it going. Some students talked about it a month ago uh, where we use Metasploit to make malware and it turns out you can have a lot of fun making Android malware with Metasploit, far more than I thought. You'll, you're gonna love this. Anyway, so um, uh, Drozer, Exynos was a driver on certain phones and the driver had a buffer overflow and you could, be, you could escalate to root with it. And it was a memory mapping issue. It sounds a little bit like the dirty cow exploit to me. Anyway, the point is, uh, Browser has a exploit and map abuse module that will just try to map memory incorrectly all over the place to try to get in. It might crash your phone, but it might also give you root. So if you don't really care and you're willing to accept some collateral damage, this is one way to try to get root. Anyway, um, if you want to maintain access to the phone, you have to install a special SU binary and this is what they recommend in Drozer. They have this thing called minimal SU. This will escalate any process to root any time without asking the user. So this is what tends to happen when bad guys take over your phone. They put on something like the Sony rootkit. This is why Sony got in so much trouble. Sony didn't want people copying the music. So they wanted to put a mark on your computer so they would know which computer was authorized to play that song and it wasn't allowed to play on another. So they sold criminal technology of rootkits to do that, to put, a, put software on the machine that you can't remove. That was the idea. And the, then they had the misfortune of selling some Sony music to Mark Rusinovich, who is the main technical expert at Microsoft, and he is very good at this. And when you put a rootkit on his, he knows Windows better than anybody at Microsoft. And he has an open, standing open offer to clean malware off anybody's machine anytime, because for him, it's easy. He can just look at your machine and know immediately what's wrong. And so when they put a rootkit on his machine, he said, wait a minute, that's a rootkit. He totally knew what it was, and he blew the whistle, and there was a huge thing came from it. And that's the point here. Once you, and the problem was, once you subvert the, the security model of the operating system at the base, you've ruined everything. And that's what this does. Now everybody can run as root all the time. This takes you all the way down to the security of the first iPhone, um, which ran everything as root all the time. Then, of course, there's man-in-the-middle exploits. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get in the middle. You can just host a wireless network and have people join it, like I was doing before. You got poisoning, you burp, and then you can be in the middle. Um, of course, if they're using HTTPS correctly, then they will be warned about man-in-the-middle exploits because I cannot impersonate the end device. But as we've seen, many apps do not care and don't warn you. And of course, many end users just ignore the warning and click OK, and then of course, it can't save you. Um, all right, so I got some cahoots about this. And then I want to show you the latest project, which is good, clean fun. You will enjoy it. You took out a project, right? Are you revising I made it extra credit because I tried to reproduce what we did last night and it came out different. <laughs> it, it's not just that they updated it. There's like multiple different versions of the Home Depot app and you get a different thing every time you install it. Oh. It's, it's enough to drive you nuts. So I made it extra credit. Oh. Nice. Well, I, it, I was intending to make everybody do it, but I thought it would hold still. But it totally isn't, you can do it twice in a row and you don't have the same thing happen twice in a row. That's disrespectful. I don't, I don't want to inflict so that on people. I could do something like that, but I decided I've had enough of it. There's more, there's, more, there's more exciting things to do. You tried it twice? Yeah, I did it before and I, did it, I tried to do exactly what you did and I got the thing with four and then I found out when Mirabelle was doing it, she was getting like two X's and I thought there were three. And I downloaded in the name of the file. And when I did it today, there's only one X in the file names. I thought I was making mistakes. I actually changes. That's insane. The actual file names change. It's like Windows 10 does this to you. You, you go to look for like a property sheet and it's gone. And you say, have I lost my mind? They just take away stuff. Then the next patch puts it back. It's a, they call this uh, gaslighting, right? They make you think you're crazy. They keep changing things around you until you think, I must be losing my mind. <laughs> like my Mac. I was here. I did that thing a couple weeks ago. Then I went into the lab and it wouldn't work. It never worked again. The same hardware, the same software. It just quit working. This makes, this makes you wonder. <laughs> anyway. Huh? 
So I uh, guess I'll wait a few more seconds, but seven might be as many as I have. Perhaps all these people online have gone to sleep. Apparently so. Oh, here. I got 10 online, supposedly, and like 10 in the room. Ah, uh, here comes some more. Okay. Seems like there's always more Kahoot abstainers than I would think. I would do the Kahoots, but anyway, I'll give it five more seconds. What's that? Your phone died. Oh, well, I... yeah. All right. Well, anyway, so which one of these will delete all your data? A useful thing to know. Yeah. Not that I know of, <laughs> but it would be a good thing to try. <laughs> birds. Birds. Yes, yes. So that's unlocking the bootloader, deletes all the data. All right. Um, so what permission allows the app to unlock the phone? Okay, that's disabled key guard. All right, and which system allows websites to unlock your phone? You can't have something secure when you have this many exceptions to the rule. <laughs> yes, it can unlock Android. Uh, I think Apple does it too. They part of like find my iPhone. You can let the web your Apple account online control it. So it's Android device manager. You can sign up for that. By the way, if you're at a company. You have mobile device systems that your company puts on to control your phone, and they can unlock it and everything too. There's like a domain controller. Um, I took out the homework for that, but we used to have one. It was a thing called IBM has a free product like that. I might put it back in. There's like 10 of these mobile device management systems, and every company has to use them because they need to know where your phone is. Have you been jailbreaking? Have you been putting on forbidden apps? You know, it's company property, just like your windows in a domain. The company wants to have management over it. Yeah, and this is just the home version of the same thing, where you can control your own phone remotely. Anyway, um, and what's the most technical attack here? Yeah. That's around memory corruption. And I must say, when I finally learned how to do this and I started teaching exploit development, I attracted a whole new generation of much higher, more highly technical students. And that's what I'm going to be teaching at Black Hat and probably in China. This is, there's a big barrier here between the people that just do layer seven stuff like JavaScript and Java and the people who go into the assembly code and the binary. This moves you up to another game and you get respect for doing it. So I highly recommend the exploit development course. If you haven't done it, you should learn it. If you know how to use stuff, like Ghidra and Ida Pro and stuff, people will give you some respect that they won't give you otherwise. Because there's more math in it, people are afraid of it. It's not really all that hard, but you do have to not panic when you see a little baffling math looking stuff. Yeah. Uh, is that exploit class Yeah, yeah, it's coming around next semester unless they fire us all. Um, how, how far is it? Well, you know, you have to do a little bit of assembly code. And at first, assembly code looks baffling and complicated, but it's really no worse than anything else. You learn like five or 10 facts, and then it's all right. But you have to go through a brief period of, it's like jumping into cold water. You go through a period of discomfort, yeah. thinking it's bad, and then after a while, you get it. The same thing with math, right? People are afraid of math. I had a student who was like storming out, refusing to do math because he had a bad time in fourth grade. And I said, dude, you can do math. And he went and took an algebra course. He said, yeah, I can do this. It's not that hard. The thing is, yeah. like I, I always just do this one little thing that goes on. Yeah. But it's not any worse than anything else. It's just taught very badly in grade school. If you go back to it as an adult, it's not that hard. If you can count on your fingers, you can do math. And if you can run any kind of computer, you can do logic. And assembly code is just another kind of logic. You know, it's, it just looks a little scary at first. But if you want something scary, look at Photoshop. Holy cow, for years, I would open Photoshop and just close it and give up. If you open Photoshop, there's like 20 bars, layers, 10 buttons on each bar. I said, dude, I was just hoping to crop out a piece of this picture, and I don't know what any of this stuff is. I know, it's, you know, that's what you just have to be trained or go through step by step. 
it's, that's the thing about assembly code. At first you say, oh, this is mind boggling complexity, but you learn a little bit, you learn the important part, you ignore 90% of it, you learn how to do a few simple things. That's how you start. And that's, it's not any worse than anything else. I still feel the same way about Photoshop. Really? Yeah. Put it in front of me, I'm like, get this away from Yes, me. I know. <laughs> exactly. But of course, and then I went and took a training class in Photoshop, and then I felt a lot better. They just have to show you how to make it do something simple. And then I can do that. Now I'm not afraid of it anymore. Class. Yeah. Oh, it was like, what was that? Well, how much was the class? Well, that was a free class on campus, like a, a one week training session or something. But anyway, after that, I was not completely helpless at Photoshop. And that's the thing. That's what the exploit development class does. It give you a start so you can realize it's not completely insane. It's just a little daunting at first. Anyway, I'm going to record my winners, Jeff and M. Okay, good. I got the winners. So now I got to show you one more fun project. And this one is a lot of fun because we get, I, I went to use Metasploit to write the Metasploit project. And I thought I would make malware the way we did it in Windows, where you make a special file and send it to the person and they run that file. But I discovered it has a module, which is much more fun. You get to add the malware inside an app. This is what I should have been using when I sent my vulnerability disclosures to the Bank of America and Chase Manhattan and everybody four years ago. All they knew how to do there was put the password in the log. But you can put interpreter shells inside the apps. And this, because they just updated APK tool two weeks ago, it works on big apps like, I'm up to a billion now. I've done apps with 10 million. This is a billion. A billion people are using this app and you can totally poison it because they didn't protect the code. And nobody cares. That's why, you know, Android is just mind boggling. It's like nations you go to where people are just drinking water with sewage in it and dying. It's just amazing the horrible things that are going on and nobody seems to care. So there's a woman sort of a yeah. it's WhatsApp is still you have know, security bots. Oh yeah. Good. Yeah, we're gonna let's poison WhatsApp. So um, you take you take WhatsApp. Let's get an Android phone. It doesn't matter what version it is. It'll work on the latest version, but I might as well use this since I've got it running. So let's put WhatsApp on here. Here's the Play Store. And by the way, you can also do it to the City College app. I didn't put that in the project, but my CCS app is vulnerable. You can poison it. Um, so well, what's um, I in fact did tell them, but they might oh, so okay, get WhatsApp, put it on your phone. Okay. There we go. Except, yeah, sure, do whatever. What do I care? Okay, everyone, everyone should have WhatsApp. Oh, sure they should. Uh, supposedly it's downloading junk. Oh, good, here comes the stuff. There we are, glorious WhatsApp. Okay, so WhatsApp is gonna be on my phone in short order. Let me go back to my instructions. Now I just gotta pull it off my phone. So uh, I had to upgrade ADK tool. Just a few commands will do it. Get to the latest version of APK tool, which I've already done. Now I pull the app from the phone. Well, I guess my instructions are for WhatsApp. That's good, I didn't remember which one I wrote them for. I gave you several choices there. In fact, I did about 30 or 40 apps and half of them can now be Trojan. Because of the previous version of APK tool, it's more like 5% of apps that can be Trojan. I had to hunt far and wide to find one that would work. Then I finally figured out how to upgrade APK tool. And like all these ones I tested were vulnerable now. Half the apps I can find in the store seem to be vulnerable to this attack, which is pretty amazing. So let's get out of here. And then ADB, um, I think I have ADB connected already. Let me make sure I'm connected. I am connected to Shamu. Okay, so this will um, show the packages on the phone. Let me first make a directory. I'm gonna um, do here and make a directory. What? Two, all right. There, just so I know what I'm doing. So now I'm gonna do ADB shell. PM list packages. This is the, I've got this memorized. I've been doing this so many times for years. This is the first step. This is where you get a list of all the packages on your phone. And that's a long list with too much junk in it. So I grep it to so like WhatsApp. Okay, so there it's com.whatsapp. Well, that's a pretty good name. So once you find the name of your package, you do ADB shell PM path. And this tells you where that is stored on the phone. So there's the APK file, data app, com WhatsApp. Now you pull it with ADB pull. Okay, now if I was gonna do this the hard way, I would use APK tools to unpack it into Smalley, modify the Smalley by writing Smalley code, repack it and re-sign it. 
But Metasploit will do all of that for you automatically, which is bloody awesome. So, and it can do various things. Metasploit has uh, many payloads. If you haven't used Metasploit before, the Metasploit has five or six different modules, but the one that makes standalone malware is called MSF Venom. And if you want to see what it can do, run MSF Venom minus L payloads, and it will show you all the payloads, and there are hundreds of them. These are the known attacks. Now, they have all technically been patched. There is a private product, a professional product, that has the unpatched ones, but there's many, many things for Windows and every other thing. So if one that gets us the Android ones, I'll grep it for Android. Because right now I'm only taking over Android phones, and there's not that many Androids. There's only like five or six. So that's patched like. Uh, well, see, this this is not really. These are not phones. This is operating as intended. Uh, you could modify the app and make a modified app and give it to other people. We're not exploiting a vulnerability here. The way that's why nobody will patch it. This is like the Java phones. You used to be able to take over every computer in the world through Java for like 10 years. My students did it all the time because it was working as intended. Java has the feature of running code. And the nobody wanted to say this is wrong, even though it's wrong. It's sort of like people saying you shouldn't just be able to go on Facebook and say, the vaccine is killing your kids because it's wrong. They say, well, we're just here to distribute information. So anyway, WhatsApp, so you can put all of these things in there. And the simplest thing is a, uh, a reverse shell. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put in a reverse shell Reverse shell is the typical kind of malware you get infected by, where you run the malware on your machine and it phones home to the command and control server. This is the way everybody does it because client machines all run firewalls and will not accept unexpected input from the outside. But you can request data from the inside because you expect to open a web browser and connect. So I have to make your victim phone home to the command and control server. That is the normal operation. So all the malware has the address to the command and control center in it. So it has to have the IP address or the domain name of the command and control center in the malware. So I have to put my Kali machine's IP address in there. So let me make sure I've got it right. ifconfig, it is still 80. So I've got the right address there in these instructions. So this is gonna make, um, let me run this command and then I'll talk about what it does. So if I do ls minus l, I have a thing here called base study PK that is 24 megabytes. That is WhatsApp. That's the whole thing. And so if I run this command, I'm going to take the base study PK and add interpreter reverse TCP malware to it, phoning home to this address to make a modified app with a different name. And I'm going to call it what's pwned dot APK. So that's what it does. And it decompiles it with APK tool. It goes into the Smalley and adds the new features, then it recompiles it, then it creates a signature and resigns. It does everything for you automatically. Yeah. Uh, architecture? It will deduce that you specifying architecture is an option, but if you don't tell it, it will it will guess. It's and it would it no architecture, so it's selected Dalvik. If you have an Android architecture, it assumes you're doing Android. If you have Mac architecture, it assumes you're Mac and so on. So typically it can guess. But you could specifically specify it, and in certain conditions, you'd have to. So now it's rebuilding it, it's resigning it, it's aligning it correctly. Now it is 25 megs, and I think it used to be something different. Let's just compare the size. Yep, it used to be 24 megs, now it's 25 megs. They just added a meg of malware inside WhatsApp. It made a new signature. So it does not duplicate the WhatsApp signature. So for example, if I try to install this, it'll reject it because the original WhatsApp is there and it will not accept this as an authorized update. So you can make a map, just like the other things we did with the Bank of America and everything else, I've made a poisoned app, but I cannot push it onto a phone that already has the real app. I have to get people to remove the old app first. Or it is, jar signer, he's using the jar signer. So anyway, now I'm gonna just, I'm gonna serve it up through a web browser. There are many ways to serve it up, but this is what seemed to work pretty well. So I do service, Start Apache. Oops, got to do service Apache to start. Okay, so this starts my machine as a web server, and it serves up data from bar www.html. So I'm going to put the app there. So I'm going to copy what's pwned to bar www.html. And now I'm serving, if I do ifconfig again, I'm serving on this address, 172.16.123.180. I'm serving a web page. So let's go to my phone. 
And what I want to do is remove the genuine one, so I can just do that right here in the store. So take off the good one. And we're going to put on the bad one. So now it's uninstalled. So I want to go home. Uh, home's down here. Okay, and now I want to run a browser of some kind. Um, if I had something like Firefox, I would use it. Uh, maybe I can get by with the default browser. Is there a browser on this thing? You see Chrome? Maybe I have to go put it on. Yeah, I'll just, you see anything good? Well, oh, there's a browser. This is the default browser. I don't think the default browser will work, but let's give it a shot. Um, if I put in that address, 172.16.123, 172, come on. Okay, 172.16, 123.180. Oh, I still spelled it wrong. 172, 16, 123.180. Okay, that's the default web server. Now, if this thing will let me download a file, and I don't know if it will, it's what's pwned.apk. Starting download. And I don't know where it went. Maybe it goes to the downloads folder. I, don't, I might have to just go download Firefox. Anyway, before I run it, I think it just put it in the downloads folder. Before I run it, I have to start a command and control server. I, it's going to try to phone home, and right now I'm not listening. So to start my command and control server, I just have to use another part of Metasploit, which is MSF console. So I launch MSF console. And this can is a general purpose handler for malware to phone home. So no database support. I don't care about that. Um, you use multi-handler. I set the payload. I listen on all addresses and exploit. This makes a um, command and control center that is listening for connections on the default port, which is 4444. So now I'm ready for victims to phone home. So let's see if I can find that thing I downloaded. Oh, there it is. Can I launch it from here? I can. Oh, that was fun. Okay. Do I want to install this? Oh, sure I do. Oh, that sounds great. Give it access to everything. Yeah, sure. That'll be swell. Install. Yes, I said install. Do it, do it. And uh, looks like it crashed, which is pretty interesting. Let's see if it got on it. Let's go home, I say. Looks like it. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay, I got a log, log in apparently. One with my high security pin. All right. Okay, now app install. Good. Open the app. And there we go. So now people can use WhatsApp. It's completely functional. It looks beautiful. They can use it. Nothing's wrong with it. And I'm in control of your phone. So now I can do anything I want on your phone. So I've got a interpreter shell. The interpreter shell is glorious stuff. For example, with the interpreter shell, if I'm on this phone and I'm doing things, like going home and opening other apps, like, I don't know, maybe I'm playing this, whatever this is, probably a game or something. Okay, so I launch whatever this garbage is. I can see what you're doing, of course, because my interpreter can do, uh, I can turn on the webcam, which I'm not sure what would happen on the phone. If I had a real phone, it'd probably work fine. But I'm not, anyway, I know what works here is getting a um, screenshot. Um, I can do SMS, geolocate. Uh, I can launch other activities. And someplace I can get a screenshot. Screenshot, there we are. With Android, it can only capture the host application. Uh, I, mean, I thought I managed to do it before. Let me check my instructions. I thought I got the screenshot thing working, but I might need a different command for it to work. The, the options are a little different. Okay, yes, yeah, screenshot works on mine, but not on this one. Let's try sysinfo and get UID. Sysinfo. Okay, that's Android. Get UID. Okay, so I'm on the phone and I have that identity. Um, I was able to get the photos off the phone when I tried it before at my Jenny Motion 8 phone. Um, screenshot seems not to work. It can only capture the host application. Oh, I know why. Because it's running as WhatsApp. WhatsApp cannot take a picture of another app. That's the Android security model. So the reason it worked when I did it before was not that I had a different Android version, but before I took a picture of the running app. So I need to bring it back to WhatsApp. So I go here and I run WhatsApp. So I can see what's happening inside WhatsApp. So if I agree and start chatting and stuff here, 
I should be able to get that screen. screenshot. And I did. Okay. And there it is, root ABK what's two EUQ. So I can see it if I go to the desktop here. What uh, this thing? Um, it's root APK what's two uh, home. Um, if I can figure out how to get there. Uh, right. Oh, APK what's two. Watch two, and there's the screenshot. So I can totally get screenshots of the phone and see what people are doing on the phone. Um, all right, and as we said, this is why the next step would be to become root. And there are various exploits. If I don't become root, all I can do with this app is whatever this app can do. And, but this app can send intents to other devices on the phone. And I think I found a few other things that work. Like, I wonder if the keylogger will work to get what you type in here. There is a keylogger. If I do help, um, it's called key scan start that you use on like PCs. And I haven't tried it on Android. So let's see if it works. I think it's called key scan. I'll just try it. Key scan. Nope. Okay. See if there's a check route. Don't let's try uh, contacts SMS geolocate. Let's try that. Geolocate. Okay, but I don't think I have a location turned on on my emulator. Um, I probably could set the ringer mode, wake lock. Send SMS would be fun if I had a real phone. Most of these are important, but they're not going to work on my emulator. Um, I could play an audio file. This is the thing punks often do, make their phone talk to you, say rude things. Webcam snap. I don't think there's a cam on this phone. I wonder if I can turn one on. Let's see what this junk is. Um, some of, like the Jenny Motion emulator supposedly has the ability to have a webcam, but I wasn't able to make it work to steal the webcam. But let's see. is this location? I could give it a location. Yep, Sydney, New South Wales. That's where I think it is. All right, that's fine. Um, do I? Ha this might be a camera. No, it's not a camera. It looks to me like this emulator does not support having a camera, which is, I mean, I can't probably do the webcam. I might be able to do record mic. I don't know if it has. That's the one everyone's so afraid of. Your phone is spying on you, and you can totally do that. And you could do it through the City College app. The MyCGS app, app totally works. Um, but when the NSA does that, oh, absolutely. Are they, are they having to push an, uh, an app for you to download? Or? No, that's what the amateurs do. The NSA has zero interaction exploits, where you, they just take over your phone and nothing happens. But probably you did something like click on a link, but maybe not even that. That's why MSO 867 was the king of the crop. Amazon 867 led to the Department of Homeland Security Lord. I could just take over your Windows machine and you didn't do anything. That's bloody awesome. Those, and, and that's what the NSA stuff was. Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance are like that. You don't do anything and I just take over your box. That's why the NSA is not messing around. That's why if you, if you turn on anything and you think you're keeping the NSA out, you're wrong. There is nothing you can do that will stop them. That is their entire business. The smartest people in the world, dedicated. If they want to find out what you're doing, they're going to find out what you're doing. <laughs> that is their job. Um, but you can make it so they do have to target you specifically. They can't just hoover up everything from everybody. Anyway, I don't see a keylogger. Let's see what else I found that was fun. Uh, you have a fairly limited set of attacks, but it's still kind of fun. And I was able to download the images off the phone. Let's see if this works. Let's see if I can take a picture on my phone. I took pictures on my other phone. The, the, it should have a camera. Does it have a camera? Um, the other one had a camera. This one might not. Oh, I just looked. That's right. I couldn't find a camera. So I guess I don't know how to put a picture on this phone. The other one, Jenny Motion, I was able to take pictures and then I was able to steal them with this attack. So anyway, check it out. That's what I wanted you to see. It is a lot of fun. And this, um, you know, maybe at some point somebody might care, like, you know, these. It's kind of disrespectful to sell people a billion copies of an app and not even protect it. I mean, all they have to do is obfuscate the code or even put an integrity check. The NFL will not fall for this. They haven't fallen for five years. The National Football League puts signature verification in their app. When you launch it, you can put a malicious version of the app, but as soon as you connect to the NFL server, it will bounce it. Say, I'm not talking to you. You must update your app. Your app is broken. It's not hard to do. These guys just don't bother, which is the message of everything in security. People just don't do the obvious things they should be doing. Anyway, uh, any questions about anything?
well, I guess I'll stop the share and go upstairs and to see if anybody wants to work on these projects. Um, okay. Oh, here comes the chat message. Uh, thanks. Okay, good. All right. All right. Uh, so I'll see you folks in two weeks. Next week is spring break, so don't expect classes here. Go find something else to do.